Buy low, sell high. It's one of the secrets to successful investing. And veteran trader Chris Vermeulen has a strategy that gives him an edge. He uses it to ride the bullish markets higher and bail out of bearish ones before it hits his portfolio. In this episode, he'll walk us through how it works and some technical indicators that help him spot trend reversals that signal opportunity. You're watching Inside Investing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Inside Investing, the show that helps you level up your financial knowledge and sharpen your investing skills. I'm your host, Hiran Amin. Joining us is Chris Vermeulen, founder of The Technical Traders. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we get into the meat of our discussion today, I uh, just wanted to get to know a little bit about you. Can you tell us about the work that you do at The Technical Traders? Sure. So long story short, there's there's a lot of different ways to analyze the markets. And uh, the title kind of says what I do. I'm a technical trader, which means I don't take in any d news, any economic data. Uh, I strictly follow the technicals, which is price action. I want to know, is price going up? Is it down? Is sentiment bullish or bearish? And we can gauge all of these things, the cycles. So I follow price action. And I learned a long time ago that even if you own a really solid company that's growing quarter after quarter, if the stock market is in a bear market or going down, it can still pull that stock down. And I've lost a lot of money. I've blown up several accounts trading and owning stocks that were growing, but holding them during a wrong stage in the market. When I like to look at the stock market like the ocean. If the tide is going up, it lifts all boats. If the tide is going down, all boats go down. It's the same with stocks. If you have to understand what the stock market is doing. And so that was the big thing I learned about 20 plus years ago was, just follow price. If something's going up and it's strong, uh, let's let's move into it and hold it. If it starts to roll over and move down, let's step aside, even if we like it. Let's go to a different asset class. There's more things than just stocks or bonds. There's different things we can move into that will be going up when, say, the stock market is going down. So that's what we do. We follow price and manage positions. It's all about risk management. If you protect the downside from taking losses, you don't need to hit any grand slams or be hunting for trades because we're not taking losses to counter any of those. We just inch our way higher. And your investing journey, in fact, is a fascinating one and ultimately led you to becoming financially independent in your 30s. So can you take us through that roller coaster? My father got this little package from Larry Williams, who's like a top known commodity trader. Um, and I read this little booklet and that sucked me. And I was like, I want to get into trading futures. And uh, long story short, I, I learned the markets. I went to off to college, got hooked on CNBC. And I started trading um, through college. My first trade was in Palm Pilot. And I made like $8,000 with a $2,000 account in like a two week window. That was my first trade, which my first real trade because I was old enough to open a trading account then. And, uh, and then it kind of brought me full circle into the whole tech bubble and I lost all my money. And that was when I learned, okay, you can't hold things uh, just because you like a company. You actually have to you know, navigate the markets based on the overall trend. And so I've had a lot of different experiences uh, in terms of I've been through a bankruptcy, I've bl blown up accounts. Uh, I, all this happened to me when I was very young and, um, and I finally got a hold of it and I was able to more or less semi-retire in about 2009, 2010, when I was 27 years old. I made money from the bull market. I profited from the bear market. Uh, the financial industry is, is my kind of passion and I've learned how to profit in all market conditions. And we're, we're going to get into those layers definitely because we do want to pick up uh, pick up some of those sort of analysis that you do. But uh, before we get into our conversation, just a quick note to our viewers, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, TD Direct Investing, so you don't miss an episode of Inside Investing. And let us know in the comments what you think about today's episode and what else you'd like for us to cover on the show. With that said, Chris, let's get talking technical. I'm going to first pose a question to you, uh, and that is you've developed a unique strategy that you've coined as asset revesting. Tell us how this works in broad strokes and how it helps you buy low and sell high. Picture yourself as a, as a surfer. You're floating out past the break in the ocean. And what are those surfers just floating out there doing? They're, they're having a good time, but they're waiting for those sets of waves to roll in. And they see those sets coming, you know, ahead of time. And then the stock market is just like that. If we're in a rising tide, we're sitting out there floating and we see these new waves of money rolling through various assets or sectors or commodities. And when they're rolling through, we pick the one that fits our personality style, our 
our skill set, what we're comfortable with risk wise. And then we hop on that wave and we surf it. And the nice thing about catching a wave that has more power than everything else is we also know when it's starting to lose power. So we know when to start trimming profits, moving our protective stops up and when to get off. And so there's like five to 12 of these like beautiful sets of waves that roll through the market every year. And we just patiently wait and we hop on those different assets. Could be bonds, could be the stock index, could be the US dollar index. Um, we could be sitting in cash. We actually sit in cash about 40% of the time because we're waiting for these waves. But when our money's in the market, we are riding something going up. Um, or in a bear market, we're actually benefiting from falling prices. We kind of play uh, almost an opposite style of strategy. So that's what we do is we're, we're not passive, but we're not really active. We just move in and out as these waves roll through, we catch them and then we, we carve out and then we safely wait on the sidelines. And the nice thing about waiting on the sidelines right now is we're making about four and a half, five percent sitting in cash, collecting uh, monthly dividends. So we're still making money safely while we wait for the next set. I mean, it's really nice setup that we have uh, right now with the higher interest rates. Yeah, absolutely. Now, at first blush, this might, this might sound like you're trying to time the market, uh, which is often thought to be unsustainable, but you don't see it that way. So how does asset revesting differ from, let's say, just timing the market? Yeah. So timing the market has such a terrible rap. People, you know, it, it gets, I mean, you can't really time the market. If you do, it was, it was kind of a fluke because nobody knows what it's going to do. What we do uh, with the strategy is we follow price. We ride the coattails of trends, typically large institutions or big waves of, of the mass market piling into a sector or into a commodity. When we see these strong waves and we, from the price charts, the trend confirms it's going up. We see sentiment is strong. The money flows are strong. We say, hey, this is, this is a big wave. It is, you know, this is a swell. Let's hop on it. And so the nice thing is, is we'll never try and pick a top or a bottom. The market, whatever we're following, we'll put in a bottom. It'll start to rally. And we don't get in anywhere near the bottom. But once the uptrend is confirmed and we see their strength, we hop on that. And then the price will continue to rally potentially for several months. Uh, and then eventually price will roll over and start to sell off. And when a downtrend starts, we get out. So we're never in near the bottom and we're out quite a bit after the top, but we always catch that middle trend of a middle section of the trend uh, to the upside. And so we just follow the trends and we have a great way of identifying when trends have, have changed direction and much sooner than most people can, can do uh, allows us to lock in a lot of um, uh, profits and, and be able to really manage our risk because we don't want to hold things too long. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the central tenets of, uh, of all technical analysis. You know, you, your trend is your friend until it ends. So exactly. you want to keep it in your best books, right? Yeah. Uh, now, you talked about uh, a bit about the cycles that you go through and you observe those. So can you take us through that? What are the various stages of the stock market, market cycles and how do you trade each of them within your strategy? There are uh, four stages to the stock market. Uh, this is based around Stan Weinstein's theory. He wrote a book, um, How to Profit from Bull and Bear Markets. Old book, but I found it very powerful. When you understand there's four stages to the markets and you understand you need a different strategy for each stage, uh, it really you know, will, is a real eye opener that you realize, okay, most people have a strategy for rising stock markets. They don't have anything for a sideways or a falling market. Um, so when I look at the, this, this overall cycle, the way this works from a very high level is I have this dotted line, this moving average, and Stan follows the 150-day moving average. And so more or less, if the 150-day moving average is sloping up, price on average for like the index or the commodity is above it, then you're probably in a stage two, which is a bull market phase. We all love it. It's all we ever really want, um, or most people. Um, and so we're in a stage two. And then when price breaks below it and it's, the moving average starts to roll over, or it's chopping through it, we could be entering a stage three, which I believe we are in with the stock market right now, with the majority of stocks, they're all struggling, other than the major indexes, which are being held up by the big techs, kind of blinding everybody from the reality of the majority of stocks. Uh, and th this requires a totally different stage. This is like a stage we're in where uh, one month, one sector is doing very well, or a commodity. The next month, it's one of the worst performing. It's all over the place. So stage three are very, there's a lot of sector rotation. People don't know where to go and it's a difficult time to profit, which is why it's red. And then at stage four, when everything's sloping down, that is a, a bear market, a financial reset. Um, the tech, the, the 2000 tech bubble was a stage four decline. The 2008 financial crisis was a stage four. 
I believe we're coming into another stage four. And these, I shade this green because it's very, very profitable. It is a, a strong trend. We make money from trends. Doesn't matter if it's going up or down. And the nice thing about a bear market is that the market falls about three to seven times faster than it goes up. So in a year or two of falling prices, we can make equivalent to many, many years of a, of a bull market. So there's lots of opportunity. And then a stage one is just a dangerous zone. It's just like a stage three. It's choppy. It's trendless. It's difficult. To, you know, when there's a breakout on the chart, they don't really have follow through. Um, all of those things. So understanding these stages is very important. Uh, you've developed your trading thesis based on the interpretation of these market cycles. What's your approach to placing trades to help you then maximize your potential upside, but also limit your potential downside? We break our portfolio off into two sections, two halves, which the first half trades the SP500, which is kind of more broad market, a little slower moving. Uh, and so that side will trade the SP 500 bonds, the dollar and a cash equivalent uh, ETF that pays us uh, monthly dividends. The other half of our portfolio focus on the NASDAQ, which is kind of growth and, and, and tech heavy. And, uh, and then it also plays the, the bond and dollar and, um, and a cash position as well. So we, we kind of split our portfolio to, to growth and broad markets. Sometimes we'll just have a signal in, say, the SP 500. And half of our portfolio will stay in cash, just collecting a monthly dividend. Um, and the other times it could just be a tech play. So just by splitting off between um, general market and then growth reduces our, our risk and exposure. Um, the other thing is we always have a stop. As soon as we get into a trade, we have a, a stop, depending on the asset, it could range from 5% or 3% to 5%, depending on, on the asset we're in. As the market moves up, we scale out, we hit profit targets. And so as the market reaches these threshold levels, based on volatility and cycle analysis and trends and things like that, we start to sell off some of that position and we move it to cash. For example, um, on this chart, we can see here, we hit a first target, second target, third target, and then we had a, a, a reload. You could get back into the position and then more or less it has uh, reversed directions. Um, and so we scale out and that allows us to eventually knowing that the market was gonna wanna roll over and reset. Uh, when it does, we're not holding a full position. Um, each of these threshold levels where our targets are, and it changes depending on the asset, is based on statistical analysis, how, it, how this type of asset moves in the past, because every asset has its own personality. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is every asset and everything you invest or trade, you need to know it inside and out. And that's, it comes back to those waves that roll through. Um, yeah. We pick one that we know, that we're comfortable with, that fits our criteria, that's in our strategy. And then we hop on that one. We don't just pick a random one because it's rolling through. That adds a lot of risk because we don't know where we should put our stops. Where are the targets where it naturally wants to reverse directions if, if it doesn't have enough momentum? We wanna make sure we lock in partial profits just before those first average thresholds. Interesting you mentioned that because you, by the sounds of it, you, you, you rotate through just a, a handful of securities that you're, you're very familiar with, but they're ETFs rather than individual securities from what I can tell that makes up a part of your strategy. So why, why take that direction using ETFs versus the individuals? Stocks are volatile. You get hit with news all the time. Um, and you can't, you can't put your whole portfolio I into work uh, because it's super high risk. I like ETFs because everyone can pile in in a blink of an eye with a market order. Uh, you can put your entire portfolio to work. You don't have to have 15 stocks and your money spread out and you run around with your head cut off trying to track them all. And um, it, it adds security. So I like things that move slow, that have beautiful waves like this. I will take this any day over any fast moving stock that's explosive and popping and dropping. Um, I, I just found this fits my personality. With our strategy, we can see a trade coming two or three days in advance. We generally also see when um, a trend is gonna exit two or three days in advance. All of our signals are end of day, meaning when we have a sell signal, or a new entry signal, um, we get it at the close. We have all night to put the order in to, to enter at the market the next day. And you got all morning. And we'll move to different um, assets. We have a, an asset hierarchy, which more or less the, the, the hierarchy, as you just mentioned, we have just a handful of things that we trade. The top asset is always gonna be the US indexes, the SP 500 and uh, the NASDAQ. They're the most volatile. They have the most potential. If they have a buy signal, they're in an uptrend, we want to own them. And we just go 100% into the indexes because they're in a strong trend and we want to catch that. If they're not favorable, 
Then the next asset down is TLT, which is the long-term treasury bond. And um, it, it has a lot less, vol generally more less volatility than the SP 500. Um, so as the markets fall out of favor of the stock market, we move to a slower asset. And if bonds don't meet our criteria, then we move to the US dollar ETF. And the dollar is amazing because it moves super slow um, and it can go up very nicely in a very controlled way uh, while the stock market and things are falling apart. And so the stock market could be moving 15, 25% and the US dollar index only has about a three to 4% volatility, meaning that's, that's the biggest swing it has. So when everybody's freaking out and the markets are wild, we're sitting in one of the slowest asset classes, the currency, that is also one of the best at trending. So it's like, it's like riding a beautiful swell on a long surfboard. I find these asset classes, stocks, bonds, currency, are disconnected enough that you follow each one with their own analysis and when they have their trends and they fit your criteria, you can hop in them and know they're not directly connected with whatever the markets are doing. Okay, let's get into some of the technical indicators you like to use to help you buy low and sell high. The first indicator you consider is the 150 day moving average of the broader market. Why do you find this one useful? Dan Weinstein, he talked about how he liked it and that's how I naturally kind of fell upon it was reading his book and I look at it and for some reason, the 150 day moving average seems to be the cycle. It after 150 days, if that moving average is rolling over either to the downside or turning up, uh, that's how long it seems to take the whole world, the whole uh, mentality or the school of fish, the average market participants to change direction for the money flow to change. It seems to catch a very nice, um, usually a, a multi-month, multi-year trend that we can play. So I, I like it because of those reasons. Okay, Chris, well, why don't you do this? Can you give us an example of it on your, on your portfolio? And how do you, what do you, what do you look for signal wise when you got that on? From that chart I showed you before, if the 150 day, which is this blue line is sloping up and prices generally above it, we're in a bullish phase. Now there will be some, obviously we had some huge corrections in 2018 and things like that. But overall, if it's sloping up, uh, we want to be long. If it if it's starting to roll over and price is naturally below it, this is 2022, we don't want to be in it. We want to look somewhere else. And then as it starts to turn back up and price on average is above it, then we're back into a, a bullish phase. And, and the markets are naturally, you know, trending higher. So it's naturally going to be sloping up. The key is to have strategies to ide identify and, and avoid these market crashes, um, which is a bit different of a game plan. Uh, our strategy you need to have, but the 150 day just tells us like, look at raging bull market, bear market, bull market, it's over and over again. And it comes down to risk and position management to deal with these COVID crashes and, and other crashes that happen. So you need multiple things layered in here, but the 150 day, I mean, is very, very good at um, identifying these uh, going these, these overall trends. Based on that, because you're looking for those price crossover actions happening when it breaks above or below that average. Now, there's always a chance that a trader might react too quickly to a false signal. In other words, a breakout ends up being a fake out. Mm -hmm. So how do you help minimize that risk when considering this indicator? You do have to keep in mind the overall trend. If this is a strong downtrending moving average, you know, this is this is more as so a reaction high. You want to keep an eye on the overall trend. Um, uh, some of the other things I like to look at um, are the 20 day moving average, which is the, this pink moving average. You can see it's stuck underneath this one. Typically when the 20 day is above it, then you're, you're, you're in a stronger trend and you're more likely to continue to go up. But I also like to look at money flows. I like to look at um, everything in the stock market is somewhat connected. If one commodity or one asset class or, or bonds are going down or up, it's that money flowing out of that that asset class is flowing into a different asset class. So if stocks are going down, we could see gold go up. We could see utilities moving higher. Uh, maybe bonds are going up. And so we track a lot of different sectors and commodities and assets to figure out if the market starts to pull back or starts to rally. In this case, you're wanting to know about a breakout to the upside. If we have a breakout, but money is still flowing into defensive sectors like utilities and gold, say, um, and, and small cap and, and growth stocks aren't, aren't really getting any traction because people are still a little nervous. Um, then we'll be like, you know what, this is, this is just a rebound. This is a bounce at this point. We have to let price continue to move higher. We need to start to see money flowing into growth, risky stocks. 
Um, we need to probably see the VIX probably start to go down, telling us people aren't fearful. Um, we were talking about the waves rolling through the markets. Well, we look behind the scenes of the power, like where is the money flowing? That is telling us, you know, the, the strength of this move. Is there big money following into this move and flowing into the, the asset class or is it still, you know, um, uh, nervous and scared? So that's kind of how we look at things. So there's a lot of layers there. Yeah, and actually, let's let's talk on that because uh, you mentioned you, the utilities quite a bit. You mentioned gold, so is that if that's your second technical indicator you consider? Um, what, how are you then looking at it? What are you are you constantly then looking at the money flows as an indicator while looking at the equities, or what are you observing there? To kind of touch on that, so I, I have a, a graph here that if we go down and we take a look at the the stock market cycle, and the stock market cycle here is. I find very, very powerful. So generally we've got two cycles. We've got this bluish one that is the stock market cycle. And then we have the yellow one in the background, which is the economic cycle. And the stock market will, will bottom before the economy and it'll top before we go into an official recession. And that's because investors are savvy. They see businesses sales slowing. They know earnings are gonna be weaker. So they start to scale out of companies that are losing their momentum and knowing the economy is slowing. People's pocketbooks aren't you know, sending out as much money as they were. And typically near the, the a talk mar a stock market top, a major stage three top, we tend to see precious metals and miners do well. We tend to see energy and energy stocks do well. And we see industrial capital goods um, all do well. And that is exactly what we're seeing right now. We've got gold hitting new all-time highs. Precious metal miners and silver are now starting to get traction. They're starting another rally. Um, energy stocks have been screaming to the upside. Oil's in a strong uptrend. And we're seeing can industrial capital goods do, do really well. So to, to look at those, this is a major warning sign that we are very close to a recession, that we're close to a stage four decline. So for example, um, back in 2006, 2007, we had a multi-year pause in gold. And then suddenly it started to have a multi-month run up into the 2008 um, market top. And, and then what this is, is people moving into safety and defense. They, they see the economy coming to an end. They see difficult times uh, and, and they prepare. And so we've had a multi-year consolidation right now. And now we're seeing gold and silver and miners and energy. They're all doing the same thing. They're moving up because they see savvy investors see the music is about to stop. And, uh, and then what happens is eventually the stock market will go into a correction. And this is where most assets will get pulled down with the stock market and gold pulled back 34% during the 2008 crisis. You're not immune. Like these are not going to keep going up when the stock market crashes. You have to be aware. This is, yeah, we have to protect ourselves. Sometime this year, I think we're going to see the stock market put in top and then we'll probably see some type of big pullback uh, in, in gold, silver and miners and, and all of those things. And I think it'll be a great opportunity because after that, uh, we'll go into a multi-year rally in precious metals. Um, we started a, a super cycle, which um, if I was to just pull it back here, we started a super cycle in gold in about 2002, 2003. We started a new super cycle in 2019 and uh, everything is in place for you know a, a pullback, a correction. And then I think we go off and do a huge rally. So all of these defensive plays um, are early warning signs telling us that, hey, the music is about to stop globally. We're going to see a global recession. We're going to see all stock markets go down. Majority of assets get pulled down, real estate. This is an opportunity of a lifetime to not only um, benefit from things falling in pricing, but then to have as much money as you've ever, more money than you've ever had when the new cycle starts in potentially a year or two. And uh, this is how you can retire really early. I was able to do this uh, in 2010, profited from 2008 crash and the recovery. Um, it's an opportunity for all kinds of different types of investments. Okay. Uh, let's go into a third technical indicator. We talked about this at the top when we were starting the moving average conversation. We looked at the long-term moving average you look at. Let's pivot and talk about the short-term moving averages for ETFs that you're considering. Uh, which ones do you like to look at? And uh, can you throw us some examples of those? Uh, so we have this blue line here, which I, I just changed. This is the 50-day moving average. And then we have the 20 day, which is the pink. And then we have the blue, baby blue, which is the five day. And really general rule for somebody who doesn't know much about the markets and they wanna catch trends. Generally, you want the 50 day moving average, moving, sloping up. 
you want to see the 20 day moving average above it. And you want to see the five day above the 20 day moving average. So if they're layered like that, you're like, okay, we now have a crossover prices above it. We should have a nice uptrend. Eventually when the five day starts to break below the 20, that's an early warning sign. Uh, eventually uh, we'll see the 20 day start to break down and prices struggling. Uh, and then you can, you can fall into a bear market or a downtrend. And then of course you can flip back into it, an uptrend here, which is where we had our last signal, which is uh, November, right beginning of uh, November here. And then you catch this beautiful trend up and you can see we, we had a reversal with the five day moving below the 20 day. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see it a bit better here. And the five day breaks below the pink, which is a warning sign. And then we've got the five day below the 50 and the 20 day. And, and now we're, now we're into a downtrend. You know, as long as the five day is above the, the 20 day moving average, to me, that is a sign we're in a good uptrend. Um, once it's the five day breaks below it, we have lost momentum. Um, and we can, we can start to see trends change. And, but, uh, the moving averages really are the key, the five and the 20 day and the 50 day, uh, you can do very, very well trading those with the, the stock indexes. If you can yeah. put some rules into place around them. Let's talk about that stop loss a moment that you mentioned earlier on. Are you adjusting your stop losses as you're you're going up on these trends and then and then kind of holding true to them and exiting out of those? It depends on the asset. So for example, here is our our strategy and these blue lines down below, these are our stops. And we have an initial stop set and then when we hit our target, our stop will move up and then when we hit our second target, our stop will move up. So they're a fixed stop, but they do move up when we hit targets. Um, that's for the indexes. And I found just over time that the indexes have a really unique way of moving that if you put a trailing stop in, or you put too tight of a stop, you get shaken out of a trade and you end up with a bunch of losers, uh, even though you were kind of right, it's just, you were too conservative. So I like fixed stops and just move them up as you hit thresholds. On the contrary, when we're trading sectors, uh, we use a trailing stop. We use a, a much larger stop, but it trails up because we'll get into a sector and it could run 15 or 20% in a week or so. Uh, and we want to make sure that trailing stop gets yanked up and, and trails up uh, below the price because a lot of times right. sectors, especially in a stage three top, they'll rally really strong for a week or two or for a month. And then they'll just literally roll over and crash and die. And so we want to make sure that that trailing stop, and especially in this environment, just keeps following it up. And then when price eventually just goes straight up and comes straight back down, it triggers our stop and we're like, wow, out. Okay. That's a, that's a good explanation of that, Chris. And so let's, let's talk the, we'll cap off our conversation here. What are some common mistakes that you find investors make when applying your asset revesting strategy? Common mistakes. I mean, the, I think the biggest problem are people's emotions. Um, and I learned a long time ago that you have to have a strategy, you have to follow rules or else you're really just drifting around in no man's land. And people can't, can't commit to something and follow through. They don't want to take a loss. They don't want to get out of a trade. And that, that's, that's what leads them into holding a position that just keeps going down against them because they just didn't bite the bullet and get out. And I, I always tell people, I'm like, when we get stopped out of a trade, I always, I always tell everybody, I congratulate everybody. I'm like, Guys, we're out of the trade. I know we don't want to be out. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to get stopped out, but you should pat yourself on the back because getting out of a losing trade, a trade that's not working out anymore, is huge. That says you have self discipline, it says you believe in a strategy, it says you have a strategy, uh, and that you know, you're, you're managing your risk. The market has a way of getting inside your head. It will make you doubt the, the next one that is going to be the one that takes off. And, um, I had an old uh, business partner and he always says, buy when they cry, sell when they yell. And, uh, and it, you know, whenever I feel like I don't want to put on a trade, it's when I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling it, but everything is telling us we should buy from a technical standpoint. Those are the trades that take off and it, the, our emotions and the market moves in a way that it's going to be the hardest to do the trades that are going to be the ones that move the needle. Um, and the market knows that and it's, it's playing off our emotions. That's what the market is. So it's, uh, it's a very powerful force. You have to stick with the strategy, bite the bullet and follow the rules. Um, yeah. Yeah. FOMO, FOMO syndrome is a very real thing in this game Huge. Uh, when it comes to it. So 
Uh, definitely. And thank you for that conversation, Chris. Uh, just a quick note to our audience. If you want to hear more about how to apply technical analysis, check out our past episode with David Keller from Market Misbehavior. It's called How to Use Technical Analysis to Help Avoid Trading Impulses. And it's available in the Learning Center on Web Broker and on TD's YouTube page. Okay, Chris, we're going to leave it there with our conversation. Thank you for sharing some of the few technical indicators you find helpful to help you uh, place those trades. Any final thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? I, I think the key is, um, you know, people need to figure out what strategy they're trading. Are they trading something for a raging bull market? Are they, you know, are they are they in a protective phase? We're in a very difficult time right now. So it's about managing positions, managing your risk. Yeah, people have to have an exit strategy and nobody seems to want to do that. And uh, people just need to protect their capital, preserve what they have until they, they have something they're confident and comfortable with. Thanks again for joining us. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on-demand content available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. See you all next time. Have more questions? Check out the links to the right and in the description below.